Welcome to Better Health Guy Blogcasts, empowering your better health. And now, here's Scott, your Better Health Guy. The content of this show is for informational purposes only and is not intended to diagnose, treat, or cure any illness or medical condition. Nothing in today's discussion is meant to serve as medical advice or as information to facilitate self-treatment. As always, please discuss any potential health-related decisions with your own personal medical authority. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode number 58 of the Better Health Guy blogcast series. Today's guest is Dr. T.C. Theoharitis, and the topic of the show is Mast Cell Master. Dr. T.C. Theoharitis has studied the regulation of mast cell activation and its role in neuroinflammatory disease for over 30 years. He holds a master's in neuroimmunology, a PhD in pharmacology, and an MD from Yale University. He was the first to report that mast cells can secrete specific mediators selectively without degranulation, can regulate blood-brain barrier permeability, can stimulate microglia, can be activated by corticotropin-releasing hormone secreted under stress to release VEGF selectively, can be activated by the synergistic action of corticotropin-releasing hormone and neurotensin, can be activated by IL-33 and substance P synergistically to secrete the pro-inflammatory cytokine TNF, can secrete mitochondrial DNA extracellularly that is mistaken by the body as a pathogen resulting in inflammatory reactions, and can communicate with microglia and are involved in inflammation of the brain. He discovered that mast cells are inhibited by certain natural flavonoids, especially luteolin and tetramethoxyluteolin. He's published over 400 peer-reviewed papers and is in the top 5% of authors cited in pharmacological and immunological journals. He is the developer of the well-known liposomal mast cell-blocking nutritional supplement known as NeuroProtec and several other products. He is known as the Mast Cell Master, and I'm honored to have him on the show today. And now, my interview with Dr. T.C. Theo Haridis. You have been working in the mast cell arena for about 30 years, as I understand. And for many of us, this topic has really become more of interest in the past year or two, particularly in the realm of Lyme disease and mold illness, which is where my focus has been. This topic is really gaining attention very recently relative to how long you've been researching it. So it's an honor to have you on the show today. Thanks for being here, Dr. Theo. Thank you very much. My pleasure. So what drew you to study mast cells and make this area such a focus of your life's work? Uh, as things happen in science or in life, uh, it was almost by accident in the sense that I was a graduate student at Yale University, and my, I had two mentors for my doctoral thesis. And uh, one who passed many years ago, William Douglas, he was from Scotland, was an endocrinologist. And the other one, um, Paul Gringard, uh, he was mostly a biochemist. Uh, in fact, he got the Nobel Prize in 2000 in physiology and medicine. And um, uh, they were very good friends. and They were competitors as well. And when I actually uh, joined the lab, primarily Dr. Douglas's lab, my charge was to find a good secretory cells to study because Dr. Douglas was studying pituitary cells. Uh, Paul Gringer was studying neurons. And I was asked to come up with a cell that is more likely to give us sort of food for thought. And what happened was every year, at least those years, at Albert Einstein College of Medicine, there was a competition between two professors. And the students would choose the professors and the professors would choose the topic. And I was invited to attend. And there was a professor of biochemistry, Sam Zeifter, and a professor of histology, Jacques Padouer. And they basically debated a cell that was called a mast cell. And the biochemist said it was a wonderful cell because it contains all those granules with so many chemicals, it's got to be doing something significant. And Jacques Padouer said it's a useless cell because all it does is basically take up 
in its granules various molecules from the environment, and they just sit there and do nothing. And they debate it. And I said, oh, my God, here's the cell. Uh, unlike neurons and unlike pituitary cells, it has about 500 secretory granules. And at that time, we didn't even know. Now we know that each granule contains about 50 different molecules. And depending on what triggers the cell, it can make another 50 or so molecules. And what do we know about the cells? Just histamine, basically, that is being released, for which we give antihistamines after it is being released. And then a class of molecules that are very bronchoconstrictive, called leukotrienes, for which we have a drug uh, that is called Singular, for instance. Okay. So I set out, basically, and my PhD thesis was on that, to find out if these beautiful-looking cells could release selectively rather than exploding as it happens in an anaphylactic reaction. Okay. So let me stop there and I can... Very good. Yeah, that's awesome. So let's talk a little bit first, just kind of starting off with the distinction between mastocytosis and mast cell activation syndrome. How are these two things different? I will start answering by first attacking the word mast cell because in my mind it has created more problems than it's worth. The mast cell was discovered by the German scientist Paul Ehrlich and his PhD thesis in 1887 was on recognizing certain cells in the tissues that when he gave them a blue dye, they turned violet. And he called that metachromasia because of change in color from the Greek. So he saw all those dots inside the, the cell. He did not know that these were secretory granules. And he felt that this cell was feeding other cells in the environment, in, in the tissues. And because the word for breast in Greek is masto, hence mastectomy, for instance, and because the breast feeds the babies, he called the cells mast cells because they were feeding other cells. Well, he could not have been more wrong because they don't feed other cells. Yet the name stuck, and it really doesn't mean anything. And it's unfortunate because... In spite of all our efforts and in spite of all the publications, uh, I'll give you an example. Two years ago, the mastocytosis had its annual meeting in Washington, and one of the patient participants uh, ended up having seizures. And after trying basically to do whatever I could, uh, I had to call the paramedics. And when the paramedics came, I told them basically that I was a physician, uh, that um, this particular lady had mastocytosis, and very politely, the head of the paramedic said, what's wrong with your breasts? So we still don't understand what anything to do with mast cell actually is other than allergy. Okay. And this is so because in 1947 or so, histamine was discovered in the mast cells. And therefore, an association was made between the histamine being released and allergies. And ever since that time, the mast cell has become sort of the flagship for allergies, which is true, except that it doesn't do only that. So having said that, one of the things that I usually do, and you actually have a, a diagram uh, to that effect, is we don't even know what allergies really are because we use the word allergy if someone is truly responsive to a particular trigger called allergen, and if we measure in the blood the specific immunoglobulin called immunoglobulin E or IgE. So if you're allergic, then you should have IgE that responds to the allergen. And if I skin test you, you will also respond by swelling and itchiness and redness. We call that triple response of Lewis. But most individuals that we all deal with are not necessarily allergic, but they might respond to things like perfume, or they might respond to a stressful circumstance, or they might respond to a change in temperature. We're not allergic to those events. So what do we call those individuals? Until recently, meaning a few years ago, we used to call this atopic 
patients, meaning they have the propensity to have responses like they're allergic, but they're not allergic to those substances. So atopy doesn't really mean anything other than it's a broader umbrella. Or if they were sensitive also to chemicals, we might call them multiple chemical sensitivity disorder. But the allergist would say, you're not allergic, kind of get out of my office. There's nothing much I can do you know, for you. Now, if you happen to have a lot more mast cells than a normal otherwise individual, then you would fall into the domain of mastocytosis because the cis means too much or too many of something. So in that particular case, one would actually do either a bone marrow biopsy, we can talk about that in a second, or in certain cases, you might have a lot more mast cells in the skin, in which case you have cutaneous mastocytosis. And we were among the first, the first to show that there are individuals with a lot of mast cells in their bladder. Uh, it's a bladder mastocytosis. We actually call that interstitial cystitis or painful bladder you know, syndrome. So mastocytosis means a lot more mast cells in some tissue, most likely the bone marrow. Now, what if you don't have more mast cells than an otherwise normal individual, but you have all the symptoms of a mast cell responding? So either we would call that person a topic because we don't know what it means, or sensitive to something, or colleagues came up with the term mast cell activation syndrome. Now, where it gets confusing, and unfortunately we are to blame you know, for all of that, is some call it, call it mast cell activation syndrome, some call it mast cell activation disorder, some call it mast cell activation disease, some call it mast cell disease. Okay? So it is extremely confusing. And if you literally go into farther definitions, there is actually idiopathic mast cell activation syndrome. And those are the individuals who are more likely to have anaphylactic reactions to wasp stings because in those individuals, the likelihood that they might respond with an anaphylactic episode is as much as 15 times more than the overall sort of you know, population. So to make matters even more complicated, we tend to say that you can have mastocytosis without the mast cells being activated. Very rare, but you could. So mast cell activation could basically define the activation of the mast cells, whether you have mastocytosis or whether you respond, let's say, to a drug given for chemotherapy. Okay? So in my book, the mast cell activation syndrome, and I like the term syndrome, is the largest umbrella in my mind for individuals who respond to pretty much anything that would activate the mast cells. Okay, very, very good. So why do you think mast cell activation syndrome has become such a focus over the past few years? And it seems that many people with Lyme disease and mold illness and autism and other chronic illnesses have some degree of mast cell activation potentially. So is this an increasing problem because of our environment or other triggers, or is it just that we now have more awareness? I think it's both of the above plus. Uh, first, as you well know, most of the individuals that we deal with that have this symptomatology have visited health providers for over 10 years and probably as many health providers without getting basically a diagnosis. So for a long time, I think these individuals or such individuals were there. It's just that my colleagues were basically saying it's impossible for you to be having all those symptoms at the same time go see a psychiatrist. Okay. So, number one, the moment there was a different diagnosis that could encompass many of those symptoms, allow at least the patients to say, I may have this, and go and tell the physicians, I may have this, even though the physicians, even today, don't necessarily believe this. Earlier today, I was on Skype 
with a, a, a family with a four-year-old child that has that from Denmark. And basically, human services or social services are about to take the kid away because they don't believe. And they're thinking the, the parents basically are making it up okay, for all kinds of reasons without giving you know the usual term. In addition, some broad reviews have now been written about mastocytosis and mast cell activation and related diseases. And there I have to give credit, you know, one of the original patients that, it wasn't my patient, that I met at a meeting that eventually became for a while my assistant, uh, not anymore. And she's given me the permission to mention her name, Julia Stewart, out of Michigan, because she kept on telling me, and she was very convincing, as many patients have, all of you scientists write your papers in various esoteric journals, hematology, oncology, allergy. The general practitioners just don't read those journals. Try to write something in the New England Journal of Medicine. And I used to say, Julia, that's easier said than done. Make a long story short, it took us about three and a half years. And as you know, we did publish two summers ago uh, a review in the New England Journal of Medicine with two wonderful colleagues even though it was very difficult to bring the colleagues together. But Jem Akin is an allergist, and Peter Valen from Austria is a hematologist. So I tried to bring different disciplines in, and there were a lot of disagreements. And eventually there were a lot of disagreements from the reviewers, who basically said, we don't believe this, we don't believe that. So we tried to cover the field as accurately as we could. Obviously, there were five reviewers, and we went through... 49 drafts before it was actually accepted and 13 drafts after it was accepted before eventually showed up. Wow. But I'm saying this not to brag because it did make a difference. And one of the things that I'm grateful to the journal is not only they allowed us to say mast cells, mastocytosis and related disorders, that's the title, but there are two graphics in that review. One that shows the mast cell hit with as many arrows we can actually put in, in a graphic, about 30 different arrows, including pathogens, environmental triggers, innate triggers, drugs, etc. So obviously you don't have to be allergic. The mast cells are activated by many triggers. But also another graphic where the mast cell was in the middle with arrows going the opposite direction at every organ of the body, including the brain. Wow. And I've been telling patients ever since, if they don't believe you, just take the journal and show it to them. Because it will be very hard for me to imagine that a colleague will say, well, the New England Journal of Medicine is publishing junk. <laughs> yeah. So, and, and what turned out is the editor, when we eventually published the, the article, the review, said that you might get about you know, 5,000 hits because it's an esoteric topic. So far, we've got it about, you know, 49,000 hits and it's going, which wow. means, and this is physicians, you know, more, because you have to have actually, you can't open the journal unless you have a subscription. Uh, so obviously, most of those hits are from, you know, health providers. So publications made a difference, not only mine or ours, uh, awareness obviously made a difference, and an effort by the Mastocytosis Society, which was at least twofold. Firstly, some years back, they actually videotaped some colleagues, um, Jem Akin, um, uh, Mariana Castells, uh, uh, myself, and they produced a video which is given free to every physician and every patient. And the title of the video is Mast Cell Activation Symptomatology, not mastocytosis, not allergy. So it opened the door for other colleagues and, and patients to hear about it. And also, a lot of effort by Jem Atkins, Mariana Castells, others, uh, and the society. Now there's a diagnostic code for mast cell activation syndrome. Because until recently, tests could not be covered. And physicians sometimes, you know, go by the code because that's how they will be reimbursed. And there was no code for that. So that made a difference as well. So what are some of the conditions where you either know or you suspect that mast cell activation plays a role? And then are there some conditions that are commonly confused with mast cell activation where people should potentially explore this mast cell arena? Absolutely. 
Uh, firstly, I don't know what other colleagues do, but when patients approach me, I actually send them a five-page or so questionnaire that has a lot of medical history questions as well as a table of various tests to ask whether they had been done or not. Most important in my mind is to make sure that I do not miss a diagnosis that is not necessarily either mastocytosis or mast cell activation syndrome. And that's important because some colleagues have gone to the other extreme. They basically say that every disease on earth is basically uh, mast cell related. And even though I would like to think so, it's not necessarily true. And I think it, it will be important to tell patients that they have to have a very good differential diagnosis. For instance, I've had patients presenting with a lot of dysautonomia, you know, or POTS uh, with allergies or allergic-like problems, and they did have, having a pituitary adenoma that explained most of the symptoms. I'm not saying necessarily that explained everything, but it's a separate diagnosis that had to be addressed separately as well. I had patients with a lot of flushing and diarrhea that had what we call carcinoid syndrome, which is not cancer. Those are enterochromaffin cells in the gut that release primarily serotonin. Serotonin could cause headaches, hypotension, flushing, diarrhea. That was not mastocytosis or mast cell activation. Again, the drugs and the approach for that is entirely different as well. You can go in, if you can find it surgically, you pluck it out. Most of the time, most of the symptoms are gone. I'm just giving you some examples. There's something called angioneurotic edema, and a lot of such patients have a lot of edema, and that's due to a molecule called bradykinin, which can trigger mast cells. We can talk about it when we talk about maybe VIP a little later. Uh, but now there is a drug that blocks bradykinin receptors, and we can treat angioneurotic edema, and many of the symptoms disappear, and they're not necessarily mast cell related. So I have a list. So when I see patients, I give them a list uh, of potential diseases that might be mimic or might be misdiagnosed. And at least I try to go through them to make sure uh, that I don't miss them. And I know you have a table basically with some of those conditions uh, as well. Yeah, and, and that table that I just put in the list of questions that I sent you was actually from a video uh, that you had put together, I believe, okay. that I saw online. So I'll link okay. to that as well. Sure. But are there some conditions, just kind of the key ones where you think, ah, in that condition, people should explore the potential for mast cell activation to be a contributor? Right. So let me start by replying with what are the criteria for mast cell activation, at least as they have been published, even though I will qualify one of them. So you have to have symptoms that are reminiscent of allergies. So uh, let's say hives on your skin uh, or flushing, uh, regardless of what the reason is. That's one criteria. Second criteria that drugs that we use in allergies, such as antihistamines, may to some extent reduce the symptoms, not make them go away. That's a second criteria. Third one is that you might have some measurements of mediators or molecules coming from the mast cells. And typically, uh, most of us would rely on measuring the breakdown products of either histamine or prostaglandin D2. And I say breakdown products because in the blood, those are broken down within one minute. So if anybody tells me I will measure histamine in the blood, it's useless, unless you have an anaphylactic reaction. So we tend to measure methyl histamine or something called methyl imidazole acetic acid, abbreviated M like Mary IA. And the breakdown product of prostaglandin D2 is 17 beta prostaglandin F like fire to alpha. Now, according to Dr. Butterfield, Joe Butterfield from the Mayo Clinic, who's an excellent clinician and researcher, if you measure those two in 24 hour urine, which were sent cold, it has to be sent cold. If it warms up, you lost it. And I would say half the time the labs that try to measure these molecules have received the urine warm or room temperature and is useless. So if it has been cell cold 
and these are elevated, according to him, and he has published it, chances of picking up muscle activation syndrome is about 70 to 90 percent, wow. just with those two. So it's very high. Not one or the other, the combination. In my mind, if, if either one is high, it's already telltale sign I'm dealing with muscle activation. What I have to stress now is the fourth criteria, which is very complicated. It's in the diagnosis. But they say that the molecule called tryptase, which is uniquely found only in mast cell granules, has to be elevated during the attack. But the chance of drawing blood during an attack is next to zero. In other words, you're all of a sudden, you're home, you're, you're, you're flashing because you, know, you were exposed to mold. Who's going to draw blood from you at that time? and send it to the lab and keep it, you know, frozen. So it's an almost meaningless criterion in my mind, unless you're hospitalized and someone can draw blood immediately. In my mind, 90% of the people will never have tryptase elevated, okay? So uh, we have to, you know, sort of get away from trying to measure that. However, it is important to measure it if we can, because if it is elevated, 90% of the time, the patient has systemic mastocytosis. And we can talk about, you know, what we should and should not do if you have, you know, uh, time. So measuring tryptase is important, but if it's not high, it doesn't mean anything in my mind if all the other three criteria are fulfilled. So would you agree that in people with, let's say, Lyme disease, autism, mold illness from water damage buildings, that those are conditions where mast cell activation is fairly prevalent and should be explored in those people? My answer is yes, uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, let me just address autism because there I've done much more work and published than I've done in Lyme, even though we will talk about that as well. There are very, very large epidemiological studies that have been published in the last two years, long after we started saying that muscles might be involved uh, in autism, showing that the only comorbidity with autism is allergy or asthma in the patient or allergy, asthma, or an autoimmune disease during pregnancy in the mother. I mean, that tells you that there is some strong association. Now, that doesn't mean to say that one led to the other, but it's strong enough that in my book, I need to explore it and find out why. And as it turns out, most of the children have either food allergy or food intolerance, in addition to being intolerance to stress. And we could, I know we will talk about stress a little later. So, Knowing that, my effort to help improve the children with autism would be to at least address why do they have allergies, why do they have you know, sensitivities to foods and maybe other substances. Once I started dig digging into that, then the question becomes very prominent, do they have muscle activation? The difficulty is, in small children, you cannot collect 24-hour urine as you can imagine. Now, certain labs have a kind of a diaper that collect the urine as well. But the point is, in an adult, when I collect the urine, I tell them to collect it and put the jug into the refrigerator. In a child, even though the diaper might collect the urine, it's not cold. So by the time I've collected it, it's gone. So technically, I cannot prove it because I'm missing one of the key three criteria because I cannot measure it. Okay. Now, some colleagues now, but he has not been validated yet, say that if you collect the first morning urine, that's equivalent to collecting the 24-hour urine. Because basically the first morning void is kind of collected from overnight type of thing, because we don't tend to get up in the middle of the night to urinate as often, therefore. But no one has actually validated that as of yet. In other words, that if you were to measure those two breakdown products in the first void in the morning would be equivalent to collecting 24-hour urine. Right. So what are maybe the top five or seven symptoms that are really the more common things that you see in someone with a mast cell activation? Flashing would be very high on my list, regardless of what 
would, would cause it. It could be you get in the shower and you get out of the shower and the pressure of the shower you know, made you flush. Um, or you eat some food that might have a preservative that you might not know and you respond to the preservative. Um, or it might be just, I've had patients flush by just going through duty-free at airports, you know, where they're like a whole bunch of perfumes, perfumes you know, yeah. thrown at you. Uh, many patients that would come just to see me, they would flush just on the anticipation of seeing me, either because they thought I'm a big shot and all of a sudden they'll see me, or because of what I may come up in terms of diagnosis. For instance, there was one family uh, that uh, you know, asked me to see their daughter. Uh, they're from a country in the Middle East. I, I saw them actually in Spain because I happened to be in Spain. Uh, you know, she was flashing like crazy, just, just coming to see me. And when I thought she had carcinoid syndrome and not mast cell activation, she flashed even more because she was stressed out that it was a different diagnosis. Uh, so uh, that would be very... Then intermittent skin reactions, even though no one knows what they are. Uh, so, it, you know, we all know what hives are because they tend to blanch they tend to kind of, uh, you know, um, connect with each other and create bigger areas. Uh, you know, many patients haven't really seen what hives look like, but, you know, it's kind of a description. But I've seen patients that pinpoint, you know, red spots that come and go. I've seen patients that have actually brown spots that are fairly large and no one understands what they are. Uh, we can talk about those, but they're not typical um, sort of allergic uh, uh, dermatitis, if you know, you're going to call it that. Uh, I've seen also patients that have a kind of a, a lattice, uh, you know, those uh, like um, like um, uh, fishnet stockings. Imagine that being very tight on the skin or removing the stocking. What you will the impression of the skin would be? I've seen many patients like that. No one knows what they are. They're not typical uh, uh, allergic reactions. Okay, so. Anytime I see any of that, uh, I would worry. I also worry about patients that would have very dry and rough skin that might look, you know, otherwise it would look like eczema or atopic dermatitis. Okay? And in fact, at the end of the day, it might be that. Uh, but I see patients that ha don't have the diagnosis of eczema or atopic dermatitis, and this come and go without necessarily touching something. Um, you know, if, if you're cleaning with Clorox all day long, of course, you're going to have a problem. Um, or, or if you wear, you know, a type of glove, for instance, you know, surgical other glove that is made of, you know, latex instead of vinyl or whatever. But these patients just, they tell me all of a sudden, I have that. And very often, the last two uh, in the category would be, they feel like they, they, their, their skull basically is hot. Not necessarily that they're flashing, and they don't have a temperature, but they say, oh, my God, you know, my, my, my head is not, not deep inside. It's like the skin on the skull is, is hot. Or they will say that they have pins and needles, uh, and, you know, they're worried. You know, they have a migraine headache. Do they have a stroke? They say they have what you call peripheral neuropathy, but, of course, they don't use that term. All of those in my mind, are telltale signs of something much more systemic in my mind. Okay. And that I will explore it. Very good. So what are some of the substances that mast cells release in the body that create a lot of these symptoms? And is it primarily histamine or is it some of these other mediators that also play a role? Well, as I said earlier, the mast cell either makes and stores or makes from scratch about 100 different molecules. So histamine will clearly cause itching, will clearly cause swelling, it will cause headaches, it will cause, you know, can cause, you know, drop in blood pressure. Uh, the leukotrienes cause constriction of the bronchi um, that may or might not be associated. Many patients feel a tightness in their chest, but they don't have asthma and they don't have a heart attack. So that would be another uh, sign. The, there are molecules such as prostaglandins, prostaglandin PG2, for instance, that cause a lot of edema and that can cause actually pain, uh, not so much flushing. Um, then you have molecules that we don't understand very much. For instance, uh, there is a molecule uh, called Rankle 
that can make the bones leach calcium. So you get osteoporosis and osteopenia. About 60% of mastocytosis patients have osteoporosis and bone pain. That may be one uh, problem. Triptase, interestingly enough, even though it is the only molecule that we can at least so far say it is uniquely made in mast cells, we don't know what it does in the body. We know it activates receptors called PAR, protease-activated receptors that cause inflammation. But we don't, we don't have any way of blocking it, and we don't know what it does in either mastocytosis or mast cell activation patients, even though it's high. So we use it as a marker, but we don't know what it does. Then you have, more often now it's been found than not, the molecules called cytokines, but those are released from other cells as well, not just mast cells. However, we were the first to publish that in individuals that have a lot of osteoporosis and pain, and then bone pain, and the Dr. Metcalf from NIH published the same thing, one molecule called interleukin-6 is very high. In fact, it's more predictive of disease activity than either triptase or histamine. Um, a, a colleague uh, from, from Germany uh, published recently a paper that heparin, which is found in mast cell granules, and it's basically an anti-clotting, uh, might also indicate disease activity. Interestingly enough, even though heparin is anti-clotting, the mast cells do not circulate. So heparin from the mast cells will not necessarily be dumped into the circulation. So obviously heparin is doing something else. And then the mast cell also releases various peptides, which are also released from nerve endings. So it might release peptides that act back on themselves, for instance. Uh, I have been collaborating and publishing most recently, about a few months ago, we published a paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences that a peptide released from nerves called substance P or SP not only triggers the mast cells, but if it is presented to the mast cells together with another cytokine called interleukin-33 or IL-33, then you produce from, let's say, 10 units of TNF, tumor necrosis factor, which is a very powerful inflammatory substance, you go from 10 units to 10,000 units of that. And we don't know how to block that uh, either. We suspect that that's more uh, involved in the gut and, and, and in other parts. The muscle also releases a molecule called hemokinin-1, which is very similar to substance B. So what happens is substance B triggers the mast cells, the mast cells release hemokinin-1, it acts back on the mast cells. And we were the first to show that the main hormone release under stress, called corticotropin releasing hormone, triggers the mast cells, but they don't release histamine or triptase. They release only cytokines. And not only that, but one CRH triggers the mast cells, they make more receptors, those specialized areas on their surface, to bind substance B. So you can see how different triggers basically augment and keep on stimulating the mast cells in a perpetuating reaction. So unless we really block the mast cells, we have no way of blocking anything. Even the immunoglobulin E, which is the primary trigger for allergic activation of the mast cells, we don't know how to block that either. So, so some people with mast cell activation seem to be very sensitive to changes in temperature as well. And so I hear people saying they go outside and it's hot or cold and they start then having some of their symptoms. So what is it about changes in temperature that trigger the mast cells? And then extending on that, are there certain times of year or certain seasons when people with mast cell activation syndrome are more symptomatic? Let me start with the last the latter part because that might be a little easier. To the extent that the muscles will respond to first changes in the environment, such as pollen. That might be a true allergy, but it will still activate the mast cells. So I believe that the mast cell activation patients and the mastocytosis patients, not only the latter have more mast cells, but the mast cells are 
readier to respond. It's like, let's say in a normal individual, you need 10 locks to unlock for the mast cell to go. In an allergic patient, you're down, let's say, to five locks to unlock. In a mast cell activation patient, maybe you have only one lock to unlock. So the cells are just readier to fire. So the allergic patients who have mast cell activation will respond easier to, let's say, a pollen count of five instead of 10. I'll give you an example. Also, because those mast cell activation patients have mast cells that are already responding to other things, they're just finicky. They're ready to fire. So they will fire at the slightest sort of provocation. I'm being silly here, but that's the only way I can explain it. I don't think the temperature itself stimulates the mast cells. Because if I were to take the mast cells that I grow, human mast cells in the laboratory, using the temperature in centigrade, which is 37 degrees would be our body temperature. So the mast cells, when I give them a trigger, they will respond between 6.8 and 7.2 degrees. The moment I deviate from those, they don't respond anymore. Okay? So, but that's the, the isolated culture mast cells. So I think what happens is, as we sense temperature with sensory nerve endings, the nerve endings send messages directly to the hypothalamus. And in the hypothalamus, so the hypothalamus is part of the brain which is right behind our nose, basically. We call it basal ganglia, and you have thalamus, hypothalamus, and amygdala. So they regulate the homeostasis in the body as well as behavior. And there are two critical parts that I believe are responsible for what you asked as well as other ways that the muscle respond. Number one, the hypothalamus, when it is the body is stressed, it will release corticotropin releasing hormone immediately. And I already described that corticotropin releasing hormone will trigger the cells. And if it's triggered along with substance P and other triggers will get things even worse. So that's one. The second is that strangely, 95% of the mast cells in the brain are in the hypothalamus. They must be doing something there. I don't understand what, but clearly they must respond to the changes that the hypothalamus is sensing, even by themselves, not necessarily because of the CRH being released. And because you said changes in seasons, let me make it even more complicated, changes in the day, diurnal rhythm. I published a paper by myself recently. If you go to PubMed, it'll come up. It's the neuroendocrinology of the mast cells. And I describe how many mast cells we have, not necessarily in number, but you know, in quantity in general, in the pituitary and in the pineal gland. So the pineal gland releases melatonin, and melatonin basically regulates our diurnal rhythm. Why should we have so many mast cells there? So I think that the mast cells respond to changes in, in seasons, in temperature, in, in other environmental conditions, by affecting the glands, and then the glands affect the mast cells, and then you kind of keep it going. So one of the things in Dr. Klinghart's work is he talks about people with Lyme, for example, that may have various microbial overgrowths, Borrelia, Bartonella, and so on, but that many of their symptoms are actually not from the bug, but rather the immune system's response to the bug that's creating inflammation. And so I'm wondering, is that what's happening here as well? Is it that maybe many of the symptoms that someone with Lyme or mold illness has are the result of the mast cells and all of these mediators that are being released? I, I, I agree with him, and, and I will uh, try to describe it a little more. Uh, two years ago, I was one of the keynote speakers in the ILAD conference uh, uh, in Pennsylvania, I think it was, and today I was actually invited to be one of the keynote speakers for the European ILAD conference in Poland in June 15th or whatever it's going to be. Um, so let's just take first that we have an infection with Borrelia. The moment you have an infection, the immune system will try to defend itself, sometimes successfully, sometimes unsuccessfully. And that means that a whole bunch of molecules, let's call them mediators, will be released in an effort to fight the disease. Well, 
some of those molecules are the interleukins we were talking about earlier. And I already said that interleukin 33 with substance B will release even more tumor necrosis factor and cause inflammation. So the stress of the infection and the stress of the symptoms that an individual basically feels, plus the molecules that are being released, no question that will affect the mast cells. So it could be just inflammation because or inflammation in association with mast cell activation. And I tend to think that the mast cell orchestrates basically the inflammatory response. That's, okay. I really think that's what it does. Uh, and in addition to all of this, other colleagues have published papers where they show that specifically Borrelia activates the mast cells. Oh, okay. So what is called toll-like receptors. Mm -hmm. So there's direct and there's indirect uh, response. And when we deal with the post-Lyme syndrome, you know, where you don't have the infection anymore, the body probably recognizes the telltale signs of what the infection left behind, and then it becomes an autoimmune response. You just keep on responding to either a real or a fictitious, not necessarily in the bad sense, fictitious, but the organism is not growing anymore. So I have to tell you something from my little history here, but I, you know, Lyme was discovered in Lyme, a small town outside New Haven. Yale is in New Haven. And when I was a medical student, uh, my professor of immunology was Alan Steer, oh, who yeah. discovered basically Lyme disease. Yeah. And as a student, I used to actually be hauled along to draw blood from patients in Lyme so he can analyze basically the blood elsewhere. Uh, Dr. Steer is at the Massachusetts General Hospital, uh, yeah. now, as you probably know. Yeah, very interesting. And, you know, it, it, the challenge in Lyme is, you know, do do all of the microbes or, or all of the Borrelia entirely eradicated? Or is it more likely the case that there are low levels of these things still in the body that are then triggering the same reaction that you're talking about with mast right. cells and other things? Uh, Let, let's talk. Yeah, go ahead. Please. Well, no, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Let, let's talk about some of those triggers. So we've talked a little bit about things like exercise, uh, temperature changes, Lyme, pollen, stress. Sounds like that's a big contributor. We talked about Borrelia. Um, I've read from your work things like heavy metals, potentially viruses. What would you say are the, if there are a top two or three triggers that are the, the real big things that are triggering most people's mast cell activation, or is that even possible to characterize? That's, that's difficult. Um, I mean, obviously, one category are true allergens mm -hmm. that would trigger the mast cells through IgE. Um, uh, then you have all this. Uh, Circumstances where the body is stressed, you know, exercise is stress, heat is stress, uh, you know, getting a divorce is stress, you know, etc. So, in fact, the Mastocytosis Society published um, some years back uh, a list of, with a questionnaire that circulated, uh, what are the, the worst triggers, at least from the mastocytosis uh, uh, patient point of view. Uh, heat and stress were 99% of the people. And you know maybe I could qualify heat change in temperature if you wish. So those are those are the bigger ones. When we're not talking about allergens, okay? Then I would say in my mind uh, mold. And uh, one of the journals it's called Clinical Therapeutics. Um, will have actually I'm the associate editor or the section editor for allergy asthma and immunology, and we're going to have actually a special section uh, coming up in the June issue, which is mold and immunity. And having said that, I also have to say something that absolutely surprised me. Even though there are many papers and reviews written about fungi and what the fungi do, you know, in asthma and allergies, it was extremely difficult to find contributors for what mold can do to these multiple symptoms that we, you know, we're discussing today. So we talk about it, but it's very hard to find good scientific papers and authors to really give you basic data. So I think that, that that particular issue might be very useful because that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying yeah. to really find you know, basic data. 
Absolutely. And, and I think even in the population of Lyme patients that I've interacted with over many years, I had Lyme myself. Uh, I, I think the mold piece is probably one of the most commonly overlooked contributors. And when people really explore mold and Lyme, they tend to do much better because they both often tend to play some role in a person's right. chronic the, Lyme the disease. The difficulty, you know, I, I was about to answer this before and I'll say it now. There are difficulties with both exposures. Um, you know, obviously in medicine, as I said earlier, we lock ourselves into our own definition. So for instance, uh, you know, if you suspect a urinary tract infection, uh, you know, you take the urinary, you count the microorganisms, and we say if you have 100,000 bugs, you know, choose the expression bugs, microorganisms, you've got an infection. So what if you have 50,000? You know, isn't that an infection for someone who might have a bladder lining that is all, you know, falling apart because of whatever? Same thing with Borrelia or any other infection. What do we really call an infection? As you know, um, we can measure the organisms. We can measure the antibodies to the organism. And IgM is the immediate response. IgG is the kind of you know, memory response. And you might not have those. And now we do, as you know, Western blot analysis for leftover pieces of the microorganism, the Borrelia, when you had an infection. And that is not an infection. In other words, you got infected and you know you probably overcome the infection or you took the drugs and, and killed the Borrelia, but Borrelia left behind parts of them. That is what we measure with what we call Western blot analysis. And in fact, as you know, there's some major molecules that we measure and some minor molecules. Those are not live organisms. They're pieces that are left over. If those are there, that means the body is still responding with an inflammatory response to leftover pieces for whatever reason are still there. Okay? So that's not an infection. That's why I'm sort of against the idea of giving someone, you know, three antibiotics for like two years. Uh, you know, if you give, you know, two, three antibiotics for a few months, you should be able to really eradicate the bacteria. Except in cases where bacteria are hiding in mucus in which case the drugs cannot penetrate the mucus. That's called biofilms sometimes. And we have to kind of get rid of the biofilm. That's another story. Now, going to the mold, there are three problems that I'm encountering with mold. And as I'm collecting these articles for this special issue, I'm actually f sort of struggling with those as well. You can measure what are called mycotoxins. In my mind, it's not important just to see black mold on your tiles which of course happens because the molds, and there are many different types of molds, release volatile molecules that you can basically absorb through your skin, lungs, you know, nose, etc. And what is very critical is the nose is the only part of the body that communicates directly with your brain through the olfactory nerve. So if you have sinusitis, that means the opening is already bigger so things that we will breathe like mycotoxin will get into your brain directly. If they're going to get into your brain, I'm not going to be able to measure them in your urine or your blood. So it's meaningless because I get many times colleagues saying, well, I measured it in the blood and it wasn't there. Or I measured it in the, in, in the urine and it wasn't there. It doesn't mean much to me. Second problem is mycotoxins are very lipophilic. So if they don't go into the brain, it will go into the fat and it will not be measured until I start detoxifying and I'm not good at that. Other colleagues are much better. And only when I start detoxifying, I'll pick it up actually in the urine. So measuring in the urine, if it's there, by my gut, it's there and we've got to do something about it. But if it's not there and I suspect it, the first thing I will tell patients if I really, and I've done it with at least five families over the last, you know, so many years, I'll say, please, can you go away for a couple of months? You know, go, go to a, a friend, go to someone where there is no likelihood to have actually mold. And invariably, they start getting better. And then, you know, they might say, or they're significant, and others might have said, oh, there was no mold in the house. And they start digging, and they'll, you know, rip up a floor, and there will be mold underneath, you know, et cetera. 
Right. So. Absolutely. Yeah. And to your point, I know Dr. Neil Nathan, when he talks about the urine mycotoxin testing, he often does glutathione for a week before to try to start that uh, excretion Good. process. Good. Um, so it sounds like you're saying that if, if mold is the trigger, that getting out of your moldy environment can help to reduce the activation of the mast cells and the resulting symptoms over time. To, to a, I think to a significant effect, not to make them go away. Because if your muscles are activated, uh, they might be activated by other things as well. But I've seen literally patients with mastocytosis, systemic mastocytosis, they were exposed to mold and when they changed homes, they got a lot better. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like from your perspective, the mold trigger is one of, one of the most significant triggers in mast cell activation syndrome. I believe it is, and I'm very worried with all the floods we had, you know, Puerto Rico, Houston, you know, Louisiana, recently in Boston. I mean, I've seen houses absolutely flooded. Yeah. I mean, those cannot be corrected, and yeah. I don't know what they will do. I mean, I literally am bracing myself for many more patients moving forward. And what is interesting, I'm preempting, you know, what I will write as an editorial, but in the Old Testament, uh, in uh, Ecclesiasticus, for instance, one of the plagues that God would basically send to the Israelites if they strayed away from God was actually mold. It's called mold or mildew. So even then, you know, they, they knew it was a problem mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, well, they didn't have any way of dealing with it, but nevertheless. So we're kind of rediscovering something. It's probably 7,000 years you know, old. So let's talk then a little bit about, we talked about CRH or corticotropin releasing hormone, the connection there between stress and mast cell activation. So that's coming all into the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis conversation. And so is that to say that many types of stress, mental stress, emotional stress, physical stress, that many of those things can be activators of mast cells? Absolutely. I, the difficulty with many of our colleagues is that this is an oxymoron because we've been teaching, you know, medical students that stress activates the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. The adrenals through chromaffin cells put out epinephrine or adrenaline as we call it in Europe and in Canada. And that's how the body goes into the fight and flight reaction. So technically, since we know that epinephrine actually and steroids because the, the Adrenals make steroids like cortisol as well. They help a lot of, we give actually cortisone to treat many diseases. We give cortisone in asthma. So technically stress should be making these diseases better, not worse. Okay? Mm. So the only way that eventually came out of each shell is when we published, and I dare say we were the first to publish, that CRH is released outside the brain as well, in the bladder, uh, in the uh, in the skin, in the gut, and there, by stimulating the mast cell, causes inflammation. And even though we published that as, as back as in 2002, I think, a, a, a paper, and it was called, you know, a Cellian paper, whatever it was called, uh, was published just a few months ago, where they showed basically in allergic responses in mice, uh, CRH was a major uh, part of perpetuating uh, the reaction. This whole idea of the hypothalamus, the limbic system, and mast cell is really interesting. I don't know if you're familiar at all with Annie Hopper's work with the DNRS. Um, and, and it's interesting because I've talked to people that have done that work of kind of retraining the limbic brain, the hypothalamus, the amygdala, and so on, and had some very obvious improvements in their mast cell and other generalized symptoms. And so I'm wondering then that kind of ties back in here to this whole idea of how the body reacts to stress and then how that turns to uh, activation of the mast cells. It's, it's really an interesting area. I wanted to ask you about VIP. So in the mold illness realm, one of the things that is part of the Shoemaker Protocol is VIP nasal spray to increase VIP. And I know in um, one of the diagrams that I had seen of yours, there was a connection between VIP and mast cell activation. So does VIP actually activate mast cells? What is that? Connection? So far, it's the only topic where I would tend to disagree. Uh, VIP has been shown by numerous colleagues to be one of the most potent triggers of mast cells. So if we were to give VIP nasally, to do something, 
uh, that might be a different ball game, but I would worry because both the nasal mast cells will respond to VIP, and if VIP gets into the hypothalamus, the hypothalamic mast cells will respond to VIP. So I would not give VIP from what I know about mast cells. Okay. Now, I stand to be corrected about what VIP might be doing otherwise that I don't know. But from what I know, I would be worried about giving it. Yeah, no, I'm glad I asked because I've seen in the diagram and it, it kind of caught my attention. Right. I thought, why is that uh, an and active? Let me, let me also, since we mentioned that, if I suspect that someone may have another reason why they have chronic diarrhea and I decided it's not irritable bowel syndrome uh, and it's not carcinoid syndrome, there are VIPomas. There are benign tumors in the gut that release VIP. It will cause diarrhea and a lot of symptoms. So I would look for a VIPoma and I would measure VIP in the blood. It's measurable. Mm -hmm. Also, there's only one other peptide that I will measure to basically ex exclude other possibilities, and that is parathyroid hormone. So PTH mm -hmm. takes basically calcium away from the bones, calcitonin takes calcium from the blood and puts it in the bones. PTH is a very strong trigger of mast cells. And we see that often in dialysis patients where PTH increases before dialysis and they go like crazy eating and histamine doesn't block that. I I'm sorry, antihistamines. Mm -hmm. So PTH and VIP I will measure on anybody I suspect before I give up uh, you know, my diagnosis. So let's come back to the Lyme and mold community. And would you say that mast cell activation is kind of like the autism spectrum where you have allergy, ADHD, and then more significantly impacted children that have autism? Would you say that, that many or most people with Lyme or mold illness have some degree of mast cell activation that's part of the picture? Or do some people have no issue with mast cell potentially? In I would say that most people do. What I cannot answer as of yet is whether they sort of acquire the mast cell activation due to the exposure to lime or mold or whatever, and now the mast cells became irritated, and now they qualify a mast cell activation because they respond to a, you know, another 50 different triggers now. Mm -hmm. Or whether the, ma the individuals had a priori a mast cell activation that makes them respond more to lime or mold. So... Yeah, unfortunately, it's like the chicken and the egg. But mm -hmm. the bottom line is, in many of the patients that I've measured the urine breakdown products that we spoke about, they had them, which okay. means that the mast cells are being activated, but not all of them. And when mast cells are activated, my understanding is that can lead to more of an opening with the blood-brain barrier. And so is mast cell activation then also associated with a very common symptom that people with Lyme and mold have, which is brain fog and cognitive type issues? Is absolutely, absolutely, yes. First of all, the mast cells line up both the gut blood and the blood-brain barrier. So if you get leaky gut, whether it's due to gluten or something else, the muscles are activated. Otherwise, you're not going to get it. Uh, so in the brain, there's no question. Again, 99% of mastocytosis or muscle activation uh, symptom patients, the first symptom they'll say is brain fog. Mm -hmm. And then we have all these other people that get brain fog in response to, as we were discussing, infections, you know, environmental problems, uh, etc. What I think happens is, the blood-brain barrier will open up, and the mast cells, it, when we actually try to open up the blood-brain barrier in mice that genetically were made not to have mast cells, it didn't open up. We published many papers on that. So what would happen is, first of all, the mast cells themselves release molecules that will affect the brain, that area. Then, by making the blood-brain barrier, will allow toxins that have not necessarily as of yet cleared in the urine and the feces to get in. And if the opening of the blood-brain barrier is sufficiently wide, then circulating white blood cells will get in there. They never do. So what will happen is the brain does not have white blood cells. The defense of the brain against anything, meningitis, is microglia. Microglia are unique cells in the brain, and they're actually more microglia than, than brain cells. And we thought that they only are scaffolding 
for the brain cells to make their connections. Well, as it turns out, it's like the clones in Star Wars. The moment they see the blood brain barrier opening up and toxins or white blood cells coming in, they start multiplying and they attack. And at the place where they attack, you literally, you, you short circuit the system. If you remember the old cars, they had spark plugs. It's like the spark plug is getting rusted. And unless we remove the rust, that's what I call inflammation, the brain will just malfunction. So if it is only that area, then you have behavioral changes. In autism, you have, you know, the inability to socialize, respond, you know, etc. In other individuals, you just cannot think straight. Just the connections are rusted. And we so need we need both to inhibit the mast cells and the inflammation and give a little high octane gas, if you wish, to help the brain recover at the same time. So the mast cells then allowing the blood brain barrier to open, allowing toxins in, creating an immune response, that's essentially one of the mechanisms of neuroinflammation in these. Correct. Cases. Yep. And so in people with chronic conditions like Lyme and mold, many people are universal reactors where they can't even tolerate the supplements or the herbs that they need to actually get well. And so I'm wondering in people that are highly reactive to even the things their doctors give them, could that also be minimized by stabilizing mast cells? Oh, that's absolutely, that's a hundred percent true. Okay. Anytime you cannot tolerate anything, it's mast cells. Uh, mm -hmm. But the tricky part there, and I gave a, uh, two lectures actually, uh, in London about a month and a half ago, one was on mastocytosis, the other was on, on autism. And these questions came up. Um, so there are a number of problems before I give a more concrete answer. Number one, as you know, 70 to 90% of all capsules and pills are fillers. It's not the active ingredient. And many companies, for good reason to some extent, give different coloring so that you know what the dose is. You know, red is five milligrams, or yellow is one milligram, or whatever. So we know that patients respond to dyes and preservatives. And there's a group of patients that have actually filed suit against the FDA for the FDA not regulating the industry, the pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical industry, to disclose that many of the fillers have gluten. I don't know if you knew that, but many of the actual pills that we actually consume have gluten in them, mm -hmm. and they don't tell patients that might be sensitive to gluten that there's gluten there. There's gluten in lipstick in chopstick. No one is telling you that unless you actually dig into it. So, number one, clearly, you have to go to the extent that, you know, you can manage economically and get some things compounded so you will have the active ingredient and nothing else. Okay? Even then, I had patients respond because sometimes even the heart capsule where the powder is put in might be from gelatin, from corn, for instance, and they might be responding to corn. Um, so if I, there are patients that I literally had to have them um, uh, not compo compounded to the extent that it's possible in just sterile water and give it to them that way. And certain things we can find in that formulation, you know, others we cannot. In addition, it, it depends where the molecule was actually extracted from to the extent that it is pure and it's not pure. The reason I'm saying that is, you know, we both do it and, you know, obviously colleagues do, you know, we don't only prescribe drugs, but we give a lot of supplements. But as you know, supplements are not regulated, even though the little company that I've helped actually was just uh, visited by the FDA. They were there for two days. We got a clean bill of health, but not, not all companies are actually visited by the FDA. And what is important is, what is the purity the amount and the source of whatever we're giving. I'll give you an example. A very popular, I use it too, flavonoid is quercetin or quercetin, however you pronounce it. But the cheapest source of quercetin is actually peanut shells. But if it's not 100% pure and you're allergic to peanuts, you're doomed and you will never know it. The second cheapest source is fava beans. You know, the green beans yeah. that are cut, right? But about 20% of Mediterranean extraction people, you know, Greek, Italians, Jews, North Africans, they lack an enzyme called glucose 6 uh, um, dehydrogenase, G6PD. G6PD, yeah. So if you have G6PD deficiency and you eat, you know, there was an article in the New England Journal of Medicine, G6PD and favism, you get actually hemolytic anemia 
and you'll never know it. Okay? So very few companies will sell supplements where they tell you the purity, et cetera. Many supplements that might say proprietary blend. One particular, for instance, company uh, that sells um, you know, luteolin, uh, I analyzed it three times. They say they have 100 milligrams luteolin. There's less than 10 milligrams there. And there's a company, I, was a, I gave a lecture in Bari, Italy, uh, and everybody was flabbergasted because a company was selling something called Glialia for autism. And they had nice brochures, and everybody thought it was my company because I promoted, as you know, luteolin for autism. The only thing, the only difference was that in the Neuroprotect, for instance, there's luteolin and olive seed oil, and they added luteolin and coconut oil. That was the only difference. But when I opened up the vial, it wasn't yellow, and luteolin is yellow. That alone will tell you that the amount of luteolin they had there was minuscule right. because it wasn't yellow. So, uh, is, so is it true then that these fillers and, th- and colorings and things that are even in the supplements, are they themselves also triggering mast cells? Mm-hmm. Absolutely, oh, yes. Okay. yes. Very interesting. In certain instances, it has been published. In other instances, we know. Uh, for instance, we know that many patients, uh, whether they have mast cell activation or not, um, uh, you know, are, are very sensitive to uh, very, you know, many preservatives uh, yeah. um, that are used especially in, you know, spicy food. Right. And, and I also, I'm sorry, go ahead. You, you mentioned gluten as one of those as well. So is that also to say in those that are gluten sensitive that an aspect of that reaction is associated to mast cell activation? Correct. Correct. Okay. In addition to the body responding to gluten and destroying our villi in, in, yeah. in the gut. But I also have to say that um, there are certain conditions that, that will trigger the mast cells that we really cannot necessarily pinpoint because we haven't done the testing. Uh, I'll give you an example. I was a consultant for one of the best known uh, cosmetic companies in the world. And they wanted me to test their skin lotions uh, before they would actually put it in the market to see if you, you know, the patients will respond. And I was amazed to see that they had as many 70 different ingredients in the lotion. I said, so how do I do that? You know, how can I take each individual ingredient and put it on the mast cell? So what I ended up doing is making a culture of mast cells in a Petri dish and putting the whole, then covering with the whole lotion, hoping that the mast cell will respond to some ingredient. But if you don't reach a certain concentration or time, it will not work. So the fact that a patient tells me that I respond it's what I need because I cannot necessarily test everything unless, of course, someone gave me the money to be doing it for every ingredient. It can be done. Right. Absolutely. So in kids with autism, I know one of the things that I had read is that you have a gentle derm topical preparation that some children can use behind the ears and the temples. Um, and ha- does that then have a systemic effect in those kids or how, what's the mechanism of action? Let, let me both describe it and qualify it. Um, So the supplements that have been available, um, one is called Neuroprotect, as you well know, and the other is called Neuroprotect Low Phenol, because in the process, we realized that about 20% of the kids are phenol intolerant, and phenols are found basically in berries, strawberries, uh, grape seeds, uh, even Tylenol is phenolic, and many, many children cannot tolerate Tylenol, chocolate is phenolic, uh, et cetera. So in those, we lowered the active ingredients, which is basically flavonoids, because they're phenolic. Resveratrol, for instance, is extremely phenolic, in case you, you, know, you know about resveratrol. Um, so for those, there are two published studies, open-label studies, there are two published studies. Uh, by now, there are about over 2,000 children that have been taking it, and I see a lot of children in London, in Athens, and in Cyprus myself, and I dare say, and you know, I've been doing science for 30 years, within a year and a half, one in four, if not in one in three children, become extremely better with simple things, including the Neuroprotect, not just the Neuroprotect, but including that. We since published that a molecule that is not phenolic so luteolin has four phenols. Quercetin has five phenols. Okay? 
this molecule, instead of having four phenols, has four methyl groups. So it's a tetramethoxylutiolin. Therefore, number one, it can be tolerated by children that have phenol intolerance. Number two, we know that many children and adults have methylation defects. That's why we give glutathione or S-adenosylmethionine. So tetramethoxylutiolin now is a methyl donor, and it's a better inhibitor of both mast cells and microglia. We published two papers, one in the Journal of Pharmacology Experimental Therapeutics and one in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences within the last year on that. Now, why don't we give methoxylutiolin instead of luteolin? And why did it have to be a skin lotion? Number one, is very expensive to purify, unlike luteolin. Okay. Uh, number two, it doesn't go into solution almost at all. Luteolin is difficult to put in solution. That's why we have it in olive seed oil, but methoxylutiolin is even harder to put. So it will be difficult even to make little capsules, let alone make you know, something that you can drink, etc. cetera. Um, so we wanted a skin lotion. First of all, that would be very hydrating, very hypoallergenic, and if possible, anti-allergic, anti-inflammatory, even though obviously we cannot call it that because it's not a drug. Okay? Now you might ask, why don't you put corset in a luteolin in a skin lotion? Because they're yellow mm -hmm. and your skin will turn yellow. Methoxyluteolin does not have color. So that was the beauty of it. So not only it's a better anti-allergic mast cell inhibitor with a lot of publications, but doesn't have color. But we could not put sufficient amount that I would have liked. I would have liked to put 10% and I could not put 10%. It becomes grainy because it's not soluble. We're struggling now to find out ways to solubilize it, but we're not quite there yet. So what I tell families is the best would be to be taking either Neuroprotec or Neuroprotec low phenol, and at the same time, try to use a lotion. If a child has any problem of the skin, it would be phenomenally helpful. And we give it actually even for diaper rash, because as you know, for diaper rash, we only give vitamin A and D, which means to high heaven, but it's not anti-inflammatory. Mm -hmm. Now, to the extent that I would like it to get into the brain, if I give it, and this is what patients told me, I mean, families told me, not the patients, if they rub it on the forehead or behind the ears, literally, whatever gets absorbed will get absorbed in the temporal vessels before it gets into the liver and gets actually uh, metabolized. And I should have thought of that myself because many times we do that for migraine patients. We have them rub actually on their forehead you know, some of the substances that we think might be helpful. I don't think it's enough by itself. Okay, very good. So let's talk a little bit about diet then. So you mentioned leaky gut playing a role in activation of the mast cells. And so we know that a focus on diet is important. What are your observations around diet? Should these mast cell activation symptoms be partially treated by using a low histamine diet? Um, the answer is yes, and let me now expand on it. In addition to all the triggers that we spoke about so far of the mast cells, and probably more that we haven't, we have to also say that there are many food substances that contain histamine. So therefore, the histamine will come not from the mast cells, from from the food source. There are very good reviews on that, but for instance, cheese, spinach, nectarines, cumin, spices in general, they have a lot of histamine. Uh, some uh, fish, especially if you rewarm the fish, the fish has actually histidine decarboxylase and it will act on the histidine and make histamine. We call that scombroid toxicity. Uh, so you might have, for instance, you know, tuna that you're warmed up and all of a sudden you have diarrhea and flushing. That's because, not because you, you're allergic, it's because histamine was in your food. Uh, so that obviously has to be avoided. And as you know, there's a wonderful site. It used to be called Low Histamine Chef. Now it's called Treating Histamine by Yasmina mm -hmm. that provides all kinds of nice recipes and other you know, ideas, etc. She herself has muscle activation. Uh, and we've been working together for, for years. So are we saying then that it's not so much the foods that are triggering the mast cells, but it's entirely or essentially entirely the histamines themselves that are coming in from the food? But that's, not that's one component. I started okay. with that because we did not discuss that at all. 
Okay. Until now. So one component, it's histamine from the foods, but it's also other molecules. For instance, there are patients that are very sensitive to aspirin and aspirin-like drugs like ibuprofen, motrin, you know, Aleve. Okay. But those are very similar to aspirin. Now, aspirin is acetyl salicylic acid, mm -hmm. but salicylates are found in many foods. Right. And I tell patients, if I suspect to avoid certain foods, uh, including, for instance, spices and spinach, et cetera, because they're, very, they're high in salicylates. And for all I know, there could be other substances that can cause flushing. For instance, serotonin causes flushing. There is a lot of serotonin-like molecules, like tryptophan, for instance, in many foods. Sometimes we give tryptophan to calm people down, but we might actually basically just stabbing ourselves in the foot because we might be giving them too much serotonin, which might cause flushing and diarrhea. So these are the food substances. We call it chemical uh, sort of allergy, if you want, or chemical sensitivity or food sensitivity. Then you have the food intolerance. That's different because food intolerance depends on IgG4. It's a subclass of IgG that can trigger the mast cells. So the mast cells, and then we go to the true allergy. So the true allergy is IgE and specific receptors. Food intolerance is IgG4 and specific receptors. And in fact, a paper was published recently, well, about a year ago, that in many patients with autism, they have very low IgG1. And I consider IgG1 protective and IgG4 actually, you know, irritating, whatever you want to call it. I always try to measure the good and the bad. So cytokines like interleukin-1, interleukin-6, interleukin-8, interleukin-33, TNF are bad. But interleukin-10 and TGF tend to be good. Same thing. If I suspect that someone has pandas, and we didn't talk about pandas or pan. Right. Now, now we call it pan, which is basically acute psychiatric sort of syndrome, or pediatric acute neuropsychiatric syndrome. Um, these individuals tend to get worse when they get infections. Okay? So there, the bacteria might be trigger the mast cells, of course, through toll-like receptors. But they, these individuals many times tend to have very low IgG1 and very high IgG4 as well. And most of the food intolerance tests only measure IgG4. Uh, there's one good test, it's called Pinner test out of New York. They can send you a package like, you know, 23andMe, for instance. You can prick your finger and send it back. And I have actually sent for food intolerance to four different labs from the same individual. And the ones that measure only IgG4 came up with results. You're like allergic to any everything. You know, what do you do now? And the other test that measure IgG1 and 4 gave me one third of the positives of the others. Another thing that I'd like to also stress whenever we do food intolerance is if you are eating a certain food substance every day, it's going to turn out false positive. So if you eat an egg every day, you will turn out to be positive to eggs. So if I suspect certain foods, I tell patients or their families, try to avoid the suspected food substance for about three days before you, you have blood drawn. Obviously, you're not going to starve someone. But, you know, if I suspect, you know, gluten, then, you know, don't give them, you know, spaghetti and whatever you every day and bread, you know, for a few days, et cetera. Are there certain foods that are potentially helpful for those people that have mast cell activation related issues? Yes, except that if I suspect chemical or multiple chemical sensitivities, I'll be kind of, you know, scared. Uh, we published a review many years ago, about 15 years ago, about natural um, food substances that might have molecules that are protective. So, assuming that you're not phenol intolerant, then anything that might have some of the good flavonoids, and I said the good flavonoids because there are about 300 flavonoids. Actually, there are 3,000 flavonoids. Um, but some of them might not be necessarily good for you. But in general, foods that have flavonoids tend to be anti-inflammatory and anti-allergic. On the other hand, you know, when you go to buy some flavonoids, they might say citrus flavonoids. Well, if you've got bladder problems, you don't want something very acidic, so I would avoid citrus flavonoids. You can buy, for instance, um, uh, soy flavonoids. 
you know, if, if a lady has breast cancer and the breast cancer is hormone positive, I don't want to give soy flavonoids because those tend to be estrogenic. So, so you know, within qualifications, I think a health professional can decide, you know, what food substances might be good. You know, echinacea, for instance, or echinacea, tend to be anti-allergic. Well, you know, I might give that. Um, so. Very good. And then oh, what are your no, thoughts? Me, no, I, I apologize. Something very important. Sure. sure. I, I, again, it was a patient who was telling me that vitamin D3 helps me with my mast cell activation. And for two years, I kept on brouhaha-ing it. Well, not, not you know, really insulting, but I said, oh, yeah, well. Well, last year, the issue on clinical therapeutics uh, last, last May was all about vitamin D3 being anti-allergic. It is. So I, now I give everybody 1,000 to 2,000 units vitamin D3 mm. uh, for the anti-allergic effect, let alone, of course, that as we discussed, many mastocytosis patients have osteoporosis, so they might need some calcium or vitamin D3 anyhow. Very good. And what are your thoughts on probiotics in this realm? I know many probiotics create or lead to production of histamine. Do you generally recommend against them, or are there certain ones that you find are helpful? It's, it's very tricky. In general, I tend to say yes. There are three provisors. One, there have been two studies published that no matter what probiotic you use, there isn't really much difference, uh, at least for minor symptoms. You know, uh, the, the ones, as you know, that at least what they stress is you have the more species you have and the more individual units you have, the better off you are. So if you have 10 different types of, you know, fungi and, and you, know, you know, 100 billion organisms is better than you having one and, you know, one million organisms. So far, I believe it. In addition to the fact that, as you correctly stated, and I'm glad you did because it's not known, that they can produce some histamine, as you know, most of the probiotics are lactobacillus. That means that if you're sensitive or allergic to casein, which is found in milk, you might respond. So in those cases, I tell patients to get soil probiotics. That's as far as I know. I'm not that knowledgeable in this area, though. Very good. One of the other things that's really interesting in, in preparing for this discussion was you have also made a suggestion that electromagnetic fields could be an activator of mast cells. And that seems like we're just swimming now in a sea of EMFs from every possible angle. So maybe just a few comments on your thoughts on EMFs and their role in mast cell activation. Firstly, uh, a wonderful colleague, Martha Herbert from Harvard, has published uh, uh, two papers, uh, sequence one after the other, about the possible role of electromagnetic waves in autism. And no one has proven it, but uh, given the fact that I suspect that there is a problem, and given the fact that most children with autism are very good with gadgets, computers, laptops, you know, iPads, all day long, they're obviously exposed to that on top of it. Um, now, how can we prove it? We have actually finished a set of experiments with a colleague of mine here at Tufts, uh, uh, Dr. Pothos, and a graduate student who got his PhD. The graduate student was from uh, electrical engineering. We have not published these results yet, but let me just preempt it by saying that um, we cut slices of brain from rats or mice. And my colleague would put an electrode and basically deliver a trigger for the neurons. And then he will measure the output of either serotonin or dopamine because those are charged molecules. And with the technique, you can measure minor quantities. The only difference of one experiment that I will tell you is that he measured what we call quanta release. You know, it's how much release is being released from these neurons in a short period of time. We're talking seconds to a minute. And then the experiment were repeated. All of this experiment is done in a box that is actually uh, metal shielding, basically electromagnetic like a cage. Yeah, yeah like a cage. The only difference was that we repeated the experiment, but we provided a magnetic, not even electromagnetic field, equivalent to what uh, a cell phone produces. 
And we got five to 10 times more release of neurotransmitters just doing that. Wow. Okay. Now, we were going to repeat this experiment in mast cells to see if the same thing will happen in mast cells. The difficulty was that the mast cells float. They don't stick. They're not like a slice of brain. And when you try to put the electrode, they move around. So it was very difficult to do the experiment, even though I would very much like to, to do this experiment. And in, in fact, if there's anybody out there, uh, you know, interested in funding that, I would love to get some funding to do it because it would be phenomenally important. I, however, have patients who say that whenever they sit in front of, uh, let's say, a, a microwave oven, they start eating. And back when we had computers with the tubes, not the, you know, the ones that we have now, which are flat, they were creating electromagnetic waves, uh, they'd say they would eat. So I, I suspect that it's a major problem. So I want to kind of start wrapping things up, talking a little bit about some of the treatment options, therapeutic interventions. So we have antihistamines on the one hand that can help reduce histamine, but then we also have mast cell stabilizers. And so maybe just a couple of comments from you there. It sounds like it's potentially important to incorporate both of those into a treatment program. So first of all, there's no question that antihistamines are useful and should be used. Uh, we use the term antihistamines, but technically they're histamine one receptor antagonists like Benadryl and histamine two receptor antagonists like Zantac. Okay, so one catches the itching and the tearing eyes, you know, and the nasal congestion. The other catches gastric acid release in the stomach that can cause gastritis, esophagitis, or reflux. Okay? Having said that, two provisors. One is that in most patients, uh, most of us double the dose. Uh, so they might say, uh, you know, 10 milligrams of something, we'll have to go to, to 20. With um, uh, Zantac, it comes to 75 milligrams and 150 milligrams. I might give even 150 milligrams twice a day. Okay? So it's not necessarily you have to use what it said, you know, out there. Number two, about 15% of patients get wired with antihistamines. Instead of we feel that they might get sedated. Uh, and we just have to note that and change antihistamines. Or it might be the fillers in the antihistamines. Very important, too much of something is not necessarily good. The antihistamines are also anticholinergic. So for instance, in order for us to urinate, we need acetylcholine to con contract the detrusor muscle in the bladder and open up the sphincter. If we have an anticholinergic effect, we'll have retention. And I've had many patients who will take 150 milligrams Benadryl and this cannot, cannot urinate. Uh, same thing will be, well, they will be constipated, kind of same idea. And finally, with the antihistamines, whenever I suspect brain problems, I want an antihistamine that gets into the brain. And most of the non-sedating antihistamines are non-sedating because they don't get into the brain. So Benadryl does get into the brain, but it's very sedating. So I like very much hydroxyzine or Atarax because it is also mild anti-anxiety. So I get basically three birds with one stone. I might get anti-allergic, anti-histaminic effect, a little sedating effect to help them go to sleep, and a little anxiolytic effect. Now, about the mast cell blockers. There are literally no mast cell blockers in the market. The only drug that exists is chromoline or disodium chromoglycate. That exists as gastrochrome if it's going to act in the gut or nasal chrome if it's going to act in the nose. And there are also drops for allergic conjunctivitis. There are a number of problems with chromoline. Before I say the problems, if it works for a patient, it works. Okay? I'm not going to say no, but even in the patients that it works, meaning they get helped, the body gets used to it very quickly. So we start with 100 milligrams a day, and within a year, you might be 400 milligrams four times a day. And then about 20% of the patients get explosive diarrhea, and about 5% of the patients can lose their hair. Okay? So it's not without problems. From the gut, less than 2% gets absorbed. So if it helps systemically, 
it might help because some nerves in the gut to communicate with the brain or the rest of the body get affected. It's not that it gets systemically uh, absorbed. Okay. Okay. Now, in the laboratory, flavonoids like quercetin, luteolin, methoxyluteolin, bit crumble into the dust. So, and we've published this. So, dose per dose, amount per amount, pre treating the mast cells, chromaline will inhibit them about 15%. Quercetin about 50, 5, 0%. Luteolin about 75%. Methoxyluteolin 90 to 100%. Okay. So why don't we have those as drugs? Because they don't have patents. Mm -hmm. And therefore the industry will not be interested in those. I even wrote both to the FDA and the National Institute of Health. And I said, what difference does it make? Let's give some breaks to some companies to make them available. Because at the end of the day, you're going to save money. You're going to save lives. You're going to save a lot of misery. It just doesn't work. There's no question in my mind that if someone were to give some of the decent flavonoids, quercetin being one, luteolin being another, it will help. The difficulty with this is that as powder, they absorb less than 10% of the gut. So we have to put them in some kind of medium to allow absorption. That's why we're mixing it up with olive seed oil. You might say, why not olive oil? Because olive seed oil is cheaper. That's about it okay. uh, than olive oil. Uh, now, someone else might come up with another way. You know, God bless them. So, but we have to increase absorption. Uh, and to the extent that this I described earlier, methoxyluteolin has so many additional benefits. Obviously, that's the route to go. So we've talked some about how things that are allergens can potentially trigger mast cells as well. So is there a place in treatment of someone who has mast cell activation for doing things like low-dose allergen therapy or sublingual immunotherapy? Does desensitizing their immune reactivity to the substance over time also then help to minimize the mast cell reaction? The first part is absolutely yes. The second part, I don't know. Uh, in other words, we know we can desensitize to individuals. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I prefer sublingual to some extent because it's not as offensive. Mm -hmm. uh, but if, it's, if it is done at a proper you know, medical setting, I don't worry. It's just sometimes with the injection, someone might respond. So I'd like to have an you know, EpiPen, which I will describe in a second, and some oxygen, at least at the beginning. Okay. Uh, now, whether the mast cells, if they're desensitized, let's say, to pollen, let's say to dust, will also now be less reactive to dust or dust mites? That I don't know. I have no way of, of knowing that. No one has done the experiment, but it's a good experiment. It can be done. Okay. Now, having done that, are there things that we can do over and beyond chromaline and, and the flavonoids? The answer is yes. Leukotrienes are very bronchoconstrictive, but when we give it in some muscle, muscle activation patients, mastocytosis patients, drugs like Singular, for instance, they do okay. So I would actually add that if I need to. Um, we obviously know that the allergic triggers are through the IgE. There is a drug that is injectable, it's called Zoller, that neutralizes IgE. It's an antibody against IgE. So for those patients that are very allergic, uh, there is actually bona fide FDA indication for chronic asthma and chronic urticaria, itching. But, you know, a lot of physicians will give it, you know, to the extent that a patient can, can pay for it, because for those indications, the insurance companies should cover it. It's about right. $1,000 a shot. But I've had patients with mastocytosis where nothing helped, including luteolin, including everything else, and eventually they start injections of Zoller, and they do much better. Wow, very interesting. Okay. And also, I apologize, but if someone has flaring problems, I might actually consider, if they're not sensitive or allergic, to give them a little corticosteroid for about a week or two just to put the flames down. Uh, for instance, I saw a child who was literally in straight jackets because he was, that child, who was four years old or three and a half, was covered with eczema. Well, my God, I'll give them a little, you know, prednisone for a little bit. Just, you know, pay, parents were, oh, prednisone is going to impede their growth. Nothing's going to happen in a week or two. But I need to, to 
to really put the flames down to be able to work with all the other stuff we spoke do, about. Do you find any of the alkalinizing things help in that realm? Like some people use baking soda and things or Alka-Seltzer Look, gold for uh, Herxheimer reactions? Does for, that- for, for, for a short period of time, they might. Okay. I don't think they really help in the long run. Okay. So let's talk a little about luteol and then, and then kind of start wrapping up with a, a little bit about NeuroProtect. And that's a product that I've used myself and, and really like and have known about for a while. So luteolin from some of your writings potentially reduces oxidative stress. It helps with inflammation, helps to inhibit mast cell activation, the microglia activation that you talked about at the beginning of the conversation. Um, You mentioned that it potentially also can help being a weak metal chelator, which is interesting that it helps with memory, brain fog, and so on. So tell us a little about NeuroProtect and why people might want to explore that product. And then in adults, is there an upper range for dosing? I generally see people taking about six six of them per day, can they go higher or, or where do we go with that? So um, regardless of the fact that it's called Muroprotec, um, it was called that because the first indication was in the clinical study for children with autism. Therefore, we thought it would be a nice connection. But as we already discussed, and you correctly uh, repeated or stated, you know, it inhibits also microglia, it's anti-inflammatory, it's, you know, chelator, it does all kinds of good things. Uh, so what did we try to do? And I say we because I helped actually this little company in Sarasota develop it. Um, uh, by the way, uh, the company would not exist had it not been uh, for two patients who became sort of friends uh, unrelated to some of the diseases we're talking about, they've been supporting the company. Otherwise, you're not making enough money to... to and this is, this is Algonaut. It's Algonaut, right. right. Yep. So I want to say that. I want to say also that uh, I uh, would go to extremes to make sure that what goes into NeuroProtect and some of the other products are products that I would give to my own children, and I did. Um, so whether it's purity, we have two independent laboratories checking the purity. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and as I said, we invite the FDA to come and examine it because I don't want to cut uh, any corners. And as you will see, even on the website, uh, we don't say that it treats or cures anything because it doesn't, mm-hmm. okay? And unlike other websites or companies that, you know, will sell whatever. The first thing we had to address is does it inhibit mast cells, does it inhibit microglia, and does it do that on human microglia mast cells? And the answer is yes, and we published it in very good journals. The second question is, how can, how can we put it in solution? Because it doesn't go in solution, as we said earlier. So we tried all kinds of different oils, and it turned out that olive oil was, was better, and we know olive oil is good for you anyhow, and I come from Greece, so why not olive oil? And then olive seed oil, because it's actually cheaper than olive oil. Having said that, I've got to indicate that it's not olive seed oil you can go and buy somewhere because it has to be collected end of November, early December, because if you let it stay in barrels, it gets oxidized, the oleic acid becomes more, and then you get heartburn when you swallow it. Okay? And whenever the olive seed oil is collected, there's also leaves and branches and pieces of the skin, which is actually squeezed to make the olive seed oil. Those have to be removed. So those are removed actually by filtration which doesn't happen in other, you know, if you go and buy some olive seed oil somewhere. So there is some process that goes into it. Once we got that, then we want it to be absolutely free of any any allergen. So whether it was actually, so the olive seed oil has certification, there are no allergens uh, there. Then the capsule that makes basically the the, the shell uh, had to be from sources that are also non-allergic. So all of those had to go in. And then we know that all the flavonoids and luteolin will be destroyed by enzymes in the gut and enzymes in the liver. So we had to find a way to allow the luteolin to escape and reach the brain. So that's why we added some quercetin in and some rooting. So in the regular, let's say, uh, neuroprotect, not the low phenol, in the low phenol, we reduce the quercetin and the rutin because those are more phenolic. So what happens is rutin in the gut 
is cleaved by enzymes and liberates quercetin. So it keeps the gut enzymes busy, if you wish. And the liver detoxifies depending on how much phenolic you are, how many hydroxyl groups you are. So what the liver does is either methylates or sulfates or glucuronates. So we literally use the quercetin as decoy to keep the liver enzymes sort of busy to allow the luteoli, which is less phenolic, to escape. Now, how precise is that? It's not. But that's the best we could do to allow some of luteoli to get into the brain. And when we measure that in animals, which we can sacrifice, we can measure luteoli in the brain. Mm. Because I can sacrifice the animals, take the brain, with high liquid pressure chromatography, we can measure how much luteolin gets there. So I know that I can get luteolin in the brain. Now, the best way for me would be if I could take the methoxyluteolin that I said earlier it's much better and made an intranasal spray because it will get directly into the brain. Therefore, I would not have to worry about any of the breakdown products. Okay? And we've been begging people every time I lecture if anybody would, you know, give us some donations uh, to, to do this research. And so far, no one has come forward. So before we finish, if you would allow me, I'll give you a very easy site that the university yeah, created uh, sure. to help us out. So is there a reason why luteolin could not be put into phosphatidylcholine and be more of a liposomal that could be absorbed through the, the mouth? Well, uh, no for a number of reasons. First of all, when, when we combine the powder, luteolin or with the quercetin together, into the olive oil, uh, you literally make rudimentary liposomes. Yeah. But whether you use the oil or the phosphatidyl cord, you're absolutely correct. We tried that. In order to make liposomes, you really have to give energy to your suspension. So you will either sonicate or shake very hard or so somehow... And there's no company that does that to create that kind of liposome. In the nose, I managed to make it. Huh? Uh, and, and, and I'm desperately trying to find companies because what, what we have at the university is not sufficient to allow me to go the next step. I mean, yeah. experimentally wise, you know, not... So not why don't you tell us, on. before I ask the final wrap-up question, why don't you tell us about how people can, if they're in a position to be able to support this kind of work, what website can they go to to connect with someone? Right. So, uh, first of all, you know, website-wise, you know, I have a website which has kind of a silly name, but it's www.mustsellmaster.com. Yep. So, everything that, that is there, uh, and, and I update it every now and then, all the papers can be downloaded for free as PDF files, etc. cetera. Uh, the algonaut.com is stripped because I don't want any possibility for the FDA to say that we're implying any cure. So even my papers are not there because by association, they might say, well, if your paper says that, you know, it might help with autism, therefore you're implying cure. And I don't want that. Okay. Um, you can go uh, to the, the Gentle Derm site, uh, gentlederm.com, has much more information because that's a lotion. And by association, we have a lot of publications that people can get from there if they don't want to go to my particular site. Okay. Uh, the university has made it very easy uh, to, to donate. And I'm, I'm sorry to say, out of probably 100 people uh, at a time, maybe one might donate $30, in spite of the fact that, you know, we talk and, you know, we help people, etc. Anyhow, so it is the, the domain is basically <coughs> giving all lowercase letters, giving dot. Tuft, which is the name of the university, T-U-F-T-S dot edu for education, forward slash, and then my last name, Theo Harides, T-H-E-O-H-A-R-I-D-E-S, all lowercase letters. If there's even one uppercase, it will not work. I'll, I'll put that in the show notes so people can just click on it as well. Okay, thank you so much. That yeah. would be, you know, very helpful. So and anybody, can, oh, by the way, yeah. one can donate from, you know, one dollar to a million, and the moment you click, and you donate, immediately you get a letter from the vice president thanking you, and it's tax deductible. 
Nice. And I'm guessing if they want to donate over a million, you'll take that as well. I'll take that too. <laughs> so the one, the one part of the question that I had asked that I, that I didn't come back to was, what is the upper range of dosing for Neuroprotect yes. in a 160-pound yes. adult? Right. So the, I, I'm glad you came back to that question. First of all, you, we had to say something on the bottle, uh, you know, something reasonable. So we put you know, one capsule per 20-pound 20 yeah, weight or 10-kilogram weight. However, it changes dramatically even in children, depending what the children are like. So if a child is very phenolic, for instance, intolerant, I might not even give the child even Europrotec for a month or so until I actually reduce the phenolic intolerance. They might be eating chocolate, they might be eating whatever. I want to reduce all of those before I move on. And I always say it's safer to start with for children. Start with one capsule, low phenol, for about a week. Just see how things go. If someone gets, if someone is phenolic intolerant, they'll just get a little hyper. But even the hyperactivity disappears in about two weeks. It's not permanent. And if anybody worries, oh my God, my child got hyper, you know, am I going backwards? They don't. And whenever they might have gained by using the Neuroprotect, they don't lose, especially children that start having better eye contact, etc. So one capsule for about a week, whether it's the regular or the low phenol, and then I build up every week for their weight. I usually tell pa parents, you know, you've, you've suffered for years. Don't try to jump and go to like 10 capsules just because. It's not going to work. So I need build up over a month, and I need about three to four months before I'll get, you know, results. Now, what happens with the children of the spectrum if they have any allergies or they have actually a runny nose, the first thing the parents will say, Doc, the nose dried up. So the mast cell related benefit is much faster than the psychological behavioral benefit. Okay. And then I'll say, let's stop at six capsules. At that point, I need to talk to someone. In other words, if I talk to someone and I see the children, the parents do you know, you know, better and other problems haven't actually shown up that have to be addressed, I'll go even higher than six. But if I don't know the family and the past, I don't want to say blindly, just go for more. Now, adults have gone to 12 a day. And if I have children or adults that also have pants like problems, Lyme, mold, you know, et cetera, then I'll go to brain gain. The brain gain has only luteolin, except, again, from algonaut.com. Mm -hmm. It has only luteolin, but it has folinic acid, and that's very important in my mind. About 40 to 50% of the children I see and other colleagues see have mutations in the gene MTHFR. And it's complicated to explain to the sort of regular person what that means. But basically, folic acid cannot become methylfolate which is the XT form. So we have to help bypass the problem. So either we'll give them folinic acid or methylfolate. Methylfolate is a little more expensive. So in brain gain, we have more luteolin per capsule than Neuroprotec. It's 150 milligrams versus 100 milligrams. There's folinic acid. There's selenium and biotin, which is good for brain cells anyhow. And we have berberine, which is sort of anti-mold and antibacterial. So you get more bank for your dollar, so to speak. And usually I say four to six capsules of that for adults with a brain gain. Now, there are also some individuals who have muscle activation or mastocytosis with or without brain fog that are very fatigued. And we know that many patients that are exposed to Lyme mold are fatigued and they might have also, you know, muscle pains. Now, is it brain, is it chronic fatigue syndrome? Is it fibromyalgia? Are there the symptoms? In those individuals, I might actually propose that they take two capsules of brain gain, one in the morning and one at night, and one capsule morning and night of fibroprotec because that has more quercetin, more luteolin, but it has coenzyme Q10 and L-carnitine in it as well. For mitochondrial yeah. support yeah. as well. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, that's super great. So I'm going to wrap up with this last question, which is what are some of the key things that you do on a daily basis in support of your own health? Oh my God. Now you really got me cornered. 
you really got me cornered. I mean, it's clear your brain is working really well, so you're doing something right. <laughs> All right. So uh, let me start with the easy part. Uh, I myself uh, have been taking uh, four NeuroProtect a day and uh, uh, until about a year ago or so, and since then I take uh, four brain gain a day, every day, two in the morning and two at night. In all honesty, I really think it helps. I mean, you know, I mean, I, I work, I don't know, 18 hours a day, whatever. Wow. Um, having said that, my late mother, bless her soul, used to say that, you know, you think in your sleep. That was her comment always. You, you think even when you're asleep. And my ex-wife, um, you know, used to complain because I would always have uh, a notebook next to me in bed. And you say, why do you bring a notebook? Because I, I'll wake up in the middle of the night and I have an idea. Um, so I take a lot of pleasure. Uh, uh, and this is what keeps me going when I see patients getting better. Okay? There's just no question about it. And that's what keeps me driving. Uh, unfortunately, I'm about 300 plus patients behind answering. Uh, today, I had a phone call from a lady who was crying her eyes out on the phone. I couldn't stop her. I just don't have time. I don't have any support at the university. I don't have uh, any support administratively wise. And if you allow me, I'll use the camera just for a second. Just so you can see what my office looks like. Wow. <laughs> um, you know, oh, it goes all around. Wow. Uh, down here. And I don't know if you can see, but on this side, there's some folders down there. I don't know if you can see the manila folders against the file cabinet. Uh -huh. There are about 50 of them. These are just one week patients that I managed to reply. Because wow. I've got to print what they send me, you know, file it. Uh, and then somehow when they, you know, get back, I have to remember. And, and until now, I used to do it entirely free. And I would say, just donate to the university. And no one is donating. Uh, so now I've got to change tactics. So even though I'll say, say I, I just cannot talk to anybody, which I would hate it because that keeps me going, or I've got to figure out some way of just someone reasonably uh, giving some money for the research. I don't care about myself. Just the research. Because right now I have zero money for research except for one donation we got from an absolutely unexpected individual who gave us $25,000. That was wow. it. Okay. And I used to have millions of dollars before. So, yeah, I mean, and this is obviously such critical, it, it's amazing to me in the realm of Lyme and mold and autism, I mean, how much in the last few years has come to this mast cell activation discussion. So it's, it's obviously a critical piece of the solution. And there are very few colleagues that deal with mast cell activation. Uh, I'm not necessarily blaming them, but I have very good colleagues at various places in the United States who beg me, don't send me these patients because they require much more time. Uh, we're not reimbursed. Uh, they don't pay out of pocket. Our practice will just basically sink. So, Well, this has been a phenomenal discussion. Uh, we win the award so today much. for the longest podcast that I've done to date, <laughs> which is great, but so much good information. I know that people will learn a tremendous amount from it. Um, I appreciate what you're doing in this realm. Like I said, I've known about NeuroProtect and about your work for many years, and thank I think that it helps uh, tremendously helps people. So thank you for all the time, all the research that you do, all of the education that you do. I really appreciate it. I look forward to continuing to learn from your work and just want to thank you for being here and taking so much time today to share with everyone. No, I, I very much appreciate it, and I congratulate you for the work that you do and others like you. Because that's, I think that's what made a lot of difference over the last few years. People Thank like you. you bring the word out. To learn more about today's guest, visit mastcellmaster.com. That's mastcellmaster.com. Thanks for your interest in today's show. If you'd like to follow me on Facebook or Twitter, you can find me there as Better Health Guy. To support the show, please visit betterhealthguy.com forward slash donate. If you'd like to be added to my newsletter, visit betterhealthguy.com forward slash newsletters. And this and other shows can be found on YouTube, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and Spotify. Thanks for listening to this Better Health Guy blogcast with Scott, your Better Health Guy. To check out additional shows and learn more about Scott's personal journey to better health, please visit betterhealthguy.com.